Spring pool rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Spring pool rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not think you won't grow weary. How many times ought I to forgive my brother? Up to seven times? I'd rather do something more like three strikes and you're out. What does Jesus say? Up to 70 times seven? R.V. Dupey is an adjunct professor of ministry at Heritage Christian University, and he is the director of Scope 310 in Florence, Alabama. And in this lesson, he helps us think about forgiveness as Paul talks about it at the end of Ephesians chapter 4. A man decides to go to his local library. He parks in the parking lot, is walking across the parking lot, headed toward the front door, completely unaware that all around him, hidden behind trees and bushes, are local and state law enforcement agents. There's a known fugitive in the library, and when he comes out, the law enforcement people are going to arrest him. This man is unaware. He walks towards the front door. The fugitive comes out of the library into the parking lot. And when he does, the agents spring from their hiding places, grab the man, throw him to the ground, put his hands behind him, and handcuff him. They leave him laying there. This man is shocked. He, he can't believe what just transpired in front of him. And so he's frozen. He can't move. He can't speak. He's just standing there in the parking lot in shock. Finally, one of the law enforcement agents looks at him deadpan and says, this library is really serious about overdue books. I think all of us probably know examples of people who have overreacted when something was due them. What about us? How do we handle it? Because someone owes you something right now. Maybe they owe you an apology. Maybe they owe you an explanation. Maybe they owe you a chance or a second chance, or maybe they just owe you the truth for a change. How do you handle it when people owe you something? Jesus calls on those who are his disciples, those who say that we follow him and wear his name, to handle things differently than the world around us. And in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25, Paul reminds us of this. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us in an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. There's so much in those few verses, so many things that are difficult. But one of the hardest things it's forgiveness, learning how to forgive. Paul says that when it comes to relational discord, we're supposed to take the initiative. He says that it's on us how we deal with the wounds that others inflict on us. 
And I know the natural reaction of us is to say, well, that's true, and, and what Paul says is absolutely right in most cases, but my situation is different. See, what was done to me was so unfair. It was so unjust. My story's different. Paul doesn't care about your story. Paul doesn't care about my story. Because Paul says none of that matters. We have to forgive. And Paul really has some credibility in this situation because after all, he is writing this from prison. And there's nothing about his imprisonment that is fair or that is just. And so he says, this is a reality of life. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be wounded. And when that happens to you, what are you going to do? We are responsible for how we handle our wounds. And we will be wounded in the kingdom of God. Nowhere does Jesus say, if you are my disciple, if you come and follow me, everything's going to be great and people aren't going to hurt you or harm you anymore. In fact, Jesus says the exact opposite. Matthew chapter 6, in the model prayer, he teaches us how to talk about and deal with those that owe us something. You remember the phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is hard stuff. It's always been hard, and people have always struggled with it. Peter did. In Matthew chapter 18, he goes to the Lord and asks for some help in, in trying to quantify this. And, and thinking that he's being generous, he says, Lord, if I forgive up to seven times, is that enough? And beginning in verse 23 of Matthew 18, Jesus tells a story. Now, you know the story well. You've heard it many times. There was a man who owed his master so much money that he couldn't have repaid that in a hundred lifetimes. The master calls him in and does the most remarkable thing, the most unexpected thing. He forgives the debt. He, he wipes the slate clean. And then that forgiven man goes out and finds a colleague who owes him pocket change. And because that man can't produce that money right then and there, he has him thrown in jail. When word gets back to the master, the master calls the forgiven servant in and he is furious with him and has him thrown in jail. Here's a couple of things that really jump out from that text that are noteworthy. One is, when we refuse to forgive, word always gets back to the master. And the second thing is, the master was not upset about the amount of debt what troubled him was the absence of mercy. We must forgive because we have been forgiven. Now, I know that, again, our rational minds kick in and, and we begin to say, yes, but my situation is different. It's just not fair. It's just not right. And so we own our resentment like it's our right to do so. But bitterness is not a fairness problem. Bitterness is an unwillingness problem. The unmerciful servant thought it, it, it was his right to hang on to that resentment, that unwillingness to forgive, to demand payback. But Jesus, in verse 30 of Matthew 18, gets to the heart of the matter. He says, the servant was unwilling. We don't stumble into bitterness. We get there on purpose. And relational bill collecting is a choice. And when we refuse to forgive, we declare our personal sovereignty. When we refuse to forgive, we make an announcement that our will has a right to a throne. And in God's eyes, our stubborn refusal is, is stunning because we're dealing with others in a way that we do not want or expect God to deal with us. When we stand before God on the great day of judgment, do we expect or want to hear God say, well, I forgave you most of your sins and, and, and I, I tried to take care of everything and, and wipe everything out, but there is this one thing. 
You remember that one thing. This one thing is, is still on the books. You still owe me for that. We don't want to hear that. We don't expect to hear that. And because of that, God expects those of us who have received such unmerited grace to have a change in our hearts. He expects us to forgive. And this is not a passive thing for God. God gets emotional about this. Going back to the parable in, in Matthew 18, Jesus says that the master was angry. Now, it's not the kind of anger that, that comes from just rage. It, it's the kind of anger that, that, that's a, a deep hurt. If you look back at the text in Ephesians chapter 4, just before verses 30 and 31, look at what Paul writes in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed from the day of redemption. When we refuse to forgive, we grieve God. When we hang on to, to resentment and bitterness like it was our right, like it was owed to us, that hurts and grieves God. So it's not that we can't forgive. It's just that we won't forgive. There's an unwillingness issue. Now, I know that there are some people in your life right now who owe you something and they do not deserve to be forgiven. But disciples of Christ, true disciples, forgive. Not because other people deserve it, but because we didn't deserve it. And God gave it to us anyway. You want to talk about unfairness? Nothing, nothing is more unfair than our salvation. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Christ's followers must remember that God let us off the hook by hooking His Son to a tree. And so we don't get hung up on whether or not people deserve to be forgiven. We don't even get hung up on whether or not they want to be forgiven. Now, please understand me. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Reconciliation is at least bilateral. The offending party or parties must have a desire to make things right. They must be willing to put forth the effort to try and work towards resolution. And then sometimes even it's still impossible. But forgiveness, forgiveness is unilateral. It's on us. It's our choice and ours alone. Kingdom forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice rooted in and springing from our unfair, the unfair grace of God that's been given to us. I don't know, but that may be why Scripture and early history tells us about the first Christians getting together and doing things on a daily basis that sometimes we only do once a week. It's because the world that they lived in was completely different than ours. They could lose their jobs. They could be tortured. They could be killed for what they believed. And so they got together on a daily basis to encourage each other, to remind each other of their story, and to reaffirm that they were not going to repay evil with evil, but that they were going to be imitators of God, imitators of Christ, and that they were going to live like Him. Oh, how the world needs that witness today. Ernest Gordon, in his book, The Miracle Over the River Kwai, writes about being a prisoner of war, the Japanese camp during World War II. He talks about the horrific treatment they received. That Each day they would be marched out of the camp into the jungle to work on a railroad for the Japanese. He talks about them working all day long in the hot sun, terrible conditions. 
At the end of the day, they would march back towards the camp and there would be two checkpoints where all of the tools would be counted to make sure that no one had lost one or put one away for some evil purpose, according to the Japanese standards. First checkpoint that day, there was a shovel missing in the count. The Japanese officer in charge asked the men, who lost my shovel? Who's taken my shovel? No one said anything. So the Japanese officer pulled out his revolver and he pointed at the head of one of the men and he said, I will shoot each of you one by one until someone tells me where my shovel is. They knew because of the history that he meant what he said. So one man finally raised his hand and he said, it was me. I lost the shovel. The officer asked him to step forward. He did. And then the Japanese officer picked up a shovel and beat that man to death right there in front of Gordon and all the other prisoners. When he was through, he threw the shovel down. He said, now pick him, the tools up. And they marched, carrying that dead body, to the second checkpoint. And when the shovels were counted there, they were all accounted for. There'd been a miscount at the first checkpoint. There was no shovel missing. Gordon said that when word began to spread through the camp of what had happened, how that one man had given his life to protect others, an innocent man, he said everything changed. They began to care more for each other. The prisoners began to treat each other like brothers and look after each other. At the end of the war, when word came of the Japanese surrender. The men who were left, who by now were nothing more than human skeletons, lined up in front of their Japanese captors, and the Japanese soldiers were afraid of what would happen next. But the Americans had been changed by this man's sacrifice. And they said, no more hate, no more killing. What we need now, more than ever, is forgiveness. We don't find our identity in our wounds. We find our identity in the one who was wounded for us. And so I urge you to focus on what he has done for you, not what others have done to you. Doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Doesn't mean that it didn't hurt because it did. And it certainly doesn't mean that we stay in a situation that's abusive and just let evil continue. But what it does mean is that we stop trying to collect the debt. And the one thing that we'll find out when we finally free the person who has hurt us is that it's us who has been liberated. Oh, that God would give us the grace to live out the gospel, the whole gospel, even the hard parts. God bless you. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God.